Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Does everybody have a handout this evening? Father, will you join us and we begin in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed night that you have given us where we might join together in learning more about our faith and your church. And as we gather here, we especially think of our cardinals gathered in Rome. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon them mightily as they select the new Vicar of Christ upon earth. We pray, too, that your Holy Spirit would come as our teacher and guide as we enter into this time of reflection and study of this great letter. For all that is done, Lord, we are very careful to give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why don't you open your Bibles? We'll begin uh, with a scriptural text and then turn the evening over. Father, are you going to be quoting from the scriptures tonight or just from the epistle? Oh, no, we're going to be in the Bible. We're going to be. How many of you brought your Bibles tonight? All right. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, it can get better. All right. John chapter 14, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Notice it doesn't say some of what I said to you, or you're going to forget most of what I said to you, or you're all going to become heretics. The Holy Spirit is going to come and bring you into all truth. I point this passage out before we turn again now to the epistle of St. Clement, the first letter of a bishop of Rome outside of the New Testament. And we just finished our series on the holy women of the Roman canon. We also have on our library our talk on St. Polycarp and St. Ignatius. And I bring these to your attention because, as I've said before, and I'll say again, the apostolic fathers of which Pope St. Clement stands at the head. The apostolic fathers are the battlefield or the playing ground of apologetics. Any dummy can flip and quote verse out of context, verse after verse out of context. But when you turn to the church fathers, what was placed in seed form grows into the great oak tree which is the Catholic Church. And Christ promised it would grow into the great oak tree, which is the Catholic Church. And so those who find themselves outside of the communion of the church need only consider what the church looked like in the first 100 and 200 years to ask themselves if they are truly Bible-believing Christians. And if they find themselves outside of that picture that they find in the early church, I would suggest that they get themselves right with the Holy Spirit. Please welcome back Father Randy Sly. Thank you, Deacon. Okay, well, we've got a lot to do tonight, and we'll do the best we can to get as far as we can. Just by way of summary, how many of you were here last week, either live or... Oh, wonderful, good. And I won't have to do all of last week, too. Um, <laughs> Anyway, just to, as a reminder of where we are, First Clement, written somewhere between 88 and 96 A.D., the earliest testimony really concerning that which is taking place in the early church outside of the New Testament scriptures, and it really has a strong place in history in terms of helping to validate and underscore those things which were going on in New Testament times. And it was written to Corinth. We studied a lot about Corinth last week. Uh, a very interesting, diverse, multicultural, 
and very secular city with a lot of things going on. It's the city where we get the term Corinthianize in terms of immorality. The Church of Corinth went through an upheaval during the time of St. Paul, and we're going to kind of get into that a little bit. And then 40 years later, Clement had to, who at that time was the third pope, had to go back and correct them again for some of the same but actually worse problems. What had happened is a small group of people, we think that they were young people based on the text, they were younger at least than the presbytery, the older priests and bishops in the church, and they actually got a, a movement working within the community of believers that caused the removal of the bishops and priests from office. So in other words, it was a mutiny. And Clement communicates to the church and basically sets them straight. And uh, we're going to see some interesting things in terms of the dichotomy between how the Protestant world and the Catholic world really kind of approach this particular letter. Anyway, one of the things that happened last week after we got through with, with our time together, I got an email from a friend of mine that lives in Boston that's visiting us from online. And so he enjoyed it. But he said, Father, you forgot to tell them about John. Okay, I got to tell you about John. St. <laughs> John most likely was alive at the time that Clement was Pope. I forgot to mention that last week because we had so much to cover. And he may have been on the island of Patmos at the time, we're not sure, but if not, he was probably in Ephesus. Either way, the church in Corinth did not appeal to him even though he was closer. Neither did Clement appeal to his authority as an apostle, but rather looked at the primacy of the church at Rome instead of the apostolic authority of John at that time. So it shows that there was an order that Clement really wanted to underscore in terms of how Corinth would relate to the entire body of Christ on earth at that time. It wasn't a free-for-all where you could go and, and tattle to the apostle. You had to go through the line of authority. Anyway, um, this is a critical book in terms, like I said, of the Protestant-Catholic debate. And it was interesting, one of the things that I think it was John Fullenbach said, and that is that there can be no real intercommunion without consensus on the question of ministry, leadership, and the offices of the church. So in other words, for Protestants and Catholics to really come into unity, one of the big questions has to do with the office of the church. The office being the office of bishop, priest, or presbyter, and deacon, and also then the order of laity, which one of the things we're going to see in Clement is he views this as an order of the church, which it is. The laity is not just those who don't have anything to do, but through our baptism, we are ordered into the laity, which is an order of the church. Now, what does this mean? One of the things that we have is that as we look at the offices of authority in the New Testament, the Protestants and Catholics have basically, although there are some variations on either side, have kind of come into two camps. One is based on charism. And this is that people are in leadership by their charisma, their charisms, the graces, the strengths, who they are as an individual. The other is that they are in office because they have been placed there through ordination. Now, one of the things that has happened is that these two positions have in some ways polarized, although personally I think you can synthesize them fairly easily. I don't think there's the big dichotomy that they put there. But this is one of the things that's happened in a lot of New Testament interpretation and also in the Protestant and Catholic scholarship having to do with Clement. And they see Clement again, which comes down very much over on this side, and they reinterpret it on the basis of their understanding of charism. The difference that we would see here would be that this would be based on spiritual succession, it would be local leadership that would emerge out of the body and for many Protestants they see it as whoops, congregate, there we go, congregational you can see that I'm much better on the overhead aren't I? Congregational incentive. In other words it's the congregations that will 
affirm the local leadership of the church. Now, in the Catholic point of view, in the area of office, is that this is an ordained position of leadership, and it is derived not by spiritual succession, but by apostolic succession. We're going to see this coming through in Clement very, very strongly. So what you have here is instead of it coming from the local, it comes from the bishops with their presbytery, their priests, and their deacons. Now this is not in terms of hierarchy, believe me. That is just in terms of, of just looking at the various orders. One of the things that they say is that this area here, this charism, is spontaneous. It just happens. But I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to John, or I'm sorry, not John, 1 Corinthians 14. That's what made me nervous. You went to John 14, right? And I was thinking 1426 is exactly where I'm going, but I was in 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians 14. But I want you to see just one little thing here. And this is Paul talking about order in the church. And he says, so what is to be done, brothers? When you assemble, one has a psalm, one has an instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything should be done for building up or equipping. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let it be two or at the most three, and each in turn, and one should interpret. If there is no interpreter, the person should keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and others discern. If a revelation is given to another person sitting there, the first person should be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. Indeed, the spirits of the prophets are under the prophet's control, since he is not the God of disorder, but of peace. One of the things that we see here is that even though they want to call this a spontaneity, there is still, with, even within the charisms, an order that Paul wants to implement. So I think that as we look at some of the things that Clement has to say, is that there is, in fact, some charism involved because how are these different individuals identified? What are the cardinals doing right now in Rome? I don't think that they're playing gin rummy and then the winner gets to be the Pope. I think they're praying a lot. If you watched any of the pre-conclave activities, those guys looked serious. Like the weight of the world was on their shoulders. And guess what? It is. It is. So they're praying because they want the charisms to be there and present. This morning uh, at Mass, I celebrated a Mass for the election of the Pope. That's what we prayed for, that the Holy Spirit would send forth one who would be able to watch over the flock, is what the colic said. So even within this apostolic succession, there is plenty of room for charism. Nonetheless, one of the things that many of the Protestant theologians have tried to do is to build a wall against the order of apostolic succession and all of that and Clement is a real problem for them because it does in fact show this as an issue. In fact, John Fuhlenbach says this about the issue. The most controversial point in Clement's theory of office is that it declares the model of a divine institution and consequently, binding forever. In other words, what Clement does is take and perpetuate the New Testament model, but place that model not just as something that I'm going to implement for now, but this is the continuing position of the church. It always has been, always will be, and is now. Follow? Is that good? Okay. Now, let's get to the excerpts. You've got your handouts. Well, first, before we actually get to the handout, I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians. Let's see what Paul was dealing with. And in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, we read, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to you who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy with all those everywhere who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always on your account for the grace of God bestowed on you in Christ Jesus. 
that in him you are enriched in every way with all discourse and knowledge as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you firm to the end, irreproachable on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by him you were called to fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Starts out good. Remember, Paul is the founder of the church. He went there and established the gospel in the city of Corinth. He's writing back, and the first thing he does is affirm their foundation, that they were formed fully and completely on Jesus Christ and have been given every grace and spiritual blessing. They've been giving any spiritual gift as needed, the charismata. But then he goes on in verse 10 and really documents why he's writing to them. I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same spirit and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. I mean, that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Anyway, I, I don't want to go on. We'll just stop right there. Anyway, the, the situation that we have is we have an identification where some people say, okay, Paul is the one that I am around. Others say Cephas. Others say Apollos. Others say, I belong to Christ. But what's happened is we have these different centers of influence within a church. It's almost like you have a church with many denominations, doesn't it? Everybody has their own centers of influence that they're using on the basis of who they believe is the one that they track with the best. Now, look at this in terms of Acts 2.42, which is something that we looked at last week. Anybody remember Acts 2.42? They devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching, okay? The apostles' teaching. What's another one? And fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Okay. These four things. Remember what I said, that this term apostles is distributed grammatically for these two. In other words, the center of fellowship in the New Testament church was around the apostles. Does this break that model? Yeah. See, what they're doing is they're choosing a person that they prefer as opposed to the person that has been placed in authority over them. And so what had happened is there were divisions or factions that came into play. So this is what Paul faced. And after writing three letters, basically, things seemed to have gotten better because at that point in time, there was... Uh, a change in the people in Corinth, and they began to operate more like the rest of the churches needed to operate, and that's something that our friend Clement is going to tell us about. So now we're going to get into the handout, chapter 1, verse 1. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read and stop periodically, but if you have a question about anything that we're going through, just get that hand up, stop me, and ask the question, because I want you all to kind of help me to mine this text and to get as much out of it as we can. There's so much here we're going to try to get through, and I've only picked, you know, just a few random chapters throughout this entire letter. And uh, how many of you had a chance to read the entire letter cover to cover? It's pretty amazing stuff. It really is. I would encourage you, even if you haven't yet, still do it as a part of your Lenten discipline. Chapter 1 of uh, the Epistle of Clement. Because of the sudden and repeated misfortunes and experiences that have happened to us, we think that we have more slowly turned our attention to those matters that are sources of strife among you, beloved. That is, of this unholy and profane rebellion so foreign and alien to God's elect. Now, he gets started pretty seriously, doesn't he? 
Now, one of the things we see here is that Rome had a problem, and they were writing to Corinth. But at this time, Domitian, who was the emperor at the time, was persecuting the church in Rome. So Domitian was distracting the church from what Clement would call something that they needed to deal with, our attention to the matter that's the source of strife among you. So Rome, and Clement in particular, felt a responsibility for Corinth. They couldn't do it because of the persecution by Domitian. But at the same time, they still didn't give, you know, give in and say, well, you know what, they can deal with their own problem. Corinth, that's okay. You know, they're a church, we're a church, let them deal with it. When they still had a chance, Clement went ahead and dealt with the issue because this is in, in one way showing that Rome understood their place of supremacy within the body of Christ, within the churches. Now, we've got persecution in Rome. What have we got going on in Corinth? What does is, what is, uh, Clement say is going on there? Rebellion. That doesn't sound good. It's got rebellion going on. And what's the other word that's there? Unholy and profane rebellion. Not just rebellion, <laughs> but this is unholy and it's profane. So we have something going on that is not of God. And it's foreign and alien to God's elect. In other words, this does not compute with how the church operates. Some reckless and rash people have kindled this sedition with such a loss of sense that your name, so solemn, well known, and loved by all, has been greatly blasphemed. Now, notice what he's doing here. He is isolating this situation from what he sees as the character of Corinth in what we'll call their golden age. So he's saying, what's going on here doesn't fit you. This is not who you were. But this is happening now. And he goes on in chapter, or verse 2, For who, when they visited you, did not approve your faith so firm and full of virtue? Who could fail to be amazed by your wise and gentle piety in Christ? Who did not proclaim the magnificence of your hospitality and not bless your perfect and secure knowledge? So what is he, in this golden age, what qualities are there in Corinth? What qualities do you see there? Piety. Piety. What else? Hospitality. Hospitality. Knowledge. Wisdom. Knowledge. knowledge. Obedience. Obedience. Okay. This is what Clement says they're supposed to be like. This is who you were. This is how you're viewed. This is how people saw you. Who, when they visited you, did not approve these things, did not see these things. And then in verse 3, you've conducted yourselves in every way without favoritism, and you've walked in God's commands by being subject to your leaders and rendering fitting honor to the presbyters among you. So he's still saying that they have done some good things. How do they walk in obedience? What was one of the things he just said there? Subject to your leaders. So now we're getting to the crux of the issue and rendering fitting honor to the presbyters among you. And as you remember, presbyter, presbyteros in the Greek is the word elder and presbyteros, where we get the word priest, which actually first was pressed, and then it became priest. You have enjoined the young to think on moderate and solemn things. The women you have commanded to conduct all their affairs in a blameless, devout, and pure conscience, each loving her own husband appropriately. You have taught them to work at home devoutly, by the rule of submission, always acting wisely. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Titus. After 2 Timothy, you'll find Titus, then Philemon, and Hebrews. So if, you, if you're at Hebrews, you can make a left turn, two books back, and you're at Titus. And just look again at the similarities between the heart of Clement toward the Corinthian church and the heart of Paul as he's exhorting Titus, who is one of his bishops. And this is what he says, As for yourself, you must say what is consistent with sound doctrine. Verse 1, 
namely that older men should be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and endurance. Sounds good. Similarly, older women should be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to drink, teaching what is good, so they may train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, chaste, good homemakers, under the control of their husbands. We aren't going to get into that. I'll give you the original Greek at another time in another teaching. <laughs> so that the word of God may not be discredited. Do you see a similarity between what Clement is saying and what Paul is saying? You've done this with the young. Verse 6, this one always kills me. Urge the younger men similarly to control themselves. That's all he says to the young men. I love it. Just teach the young men to be self-controlled. What we're going to notice is that was the problem in Corinth. So anyway, the young men were being moderate. The women were uh, working and, and laboring responsively as Christian women. To work at home devoutly, another way of translated that was to do their own business. In other words, don't be a busybody in other stuff, but do your own business. Always acting wisely or with temperance, with discretion, is another way you can translate that. And then in chapter 2, he keeps going on. You are all of a humble mind without boasting, being submissive rather than dominating, giving gladly rather than receiving. Does that sound like a familiar scripture? Anybody know what that sounds like? What does it sound like? It is more blessed to give than to receive. One of the things about Clement is he oozes scripture. And a lot of times he won't even tell you where it is. You have to go looking for it. In fact, I think it's in one of the places. He says, in scripture somewhere it says. I like that. But it's in scripture. Okay, being submissive rather than dominating, giving gladly rather than receiving, by being satisfied with Christ's provisions, and by heeding his words, you embrace them in your inner hearts with his sufferings before your eyes. I love this word. It's actually one word in the Greek that is translated inner heart. And the word is splag noise. That's kind of yucky sounding, isn't it? Well, actually, it means something not very nice either. It means your bowels. In, Old, I mean, in New Testament teaching and in, in that culture, in that time, your bowels, that was really the center of your being. That was what we now would call your heart. A good example is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. If you want to just flip there real quickly, we'll do a little Bible drill tonight. Matthew 9, 36, one of my favorite passages in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew 9, 36, actually starting in 35, Jesus went around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and curing every disease and illness. At the sight of the crowds, his heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Now, notice it says his heart was what? Moved with pity or compassion. That word heart there, guess what it is? His bowels. If you wanted to do some kind of a paraphrase, you could say, he was gripped in his gut. He was moved at the very interior of his being as he looked at the people. They were harassed and helpless. Harassed means they were attacked from the outside. Helpless means they had no strength within. Boy, that's not a place to be. But that's what he is saying here, that Corinth, with the very core of their being, in their very bowels, they embrace the fullness of the church. He was really calling them again to a high place back to this golden age. Verse 2, in this way a deep and rich peace was given to all and an insatiable desire to do good as well. Wow. As James would say, show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. They had this rich peace, and then out of that also, they had this insatiable desire. It couldn't even be quenched. A desire to do good and do well. And a full outpouring of the Holy Spirit came upon all. It was a healthy place. Okay, verse 3. And being full of the holy counsel, with good intention, with devout confidence, extend your hands to God Almighty, asking for his mercy, in case you sin unwillingly. The word there, a contest, unwillingly, without 
knowledge without forethought. In other words, the only way that you could sin is if you didn't think about it because you were conscious of wanting to be sure you did not sin. Verse 4, there was a struggle day and night for the brotherhood so that the number of his elect might be saved with mercy and conscience. So they, they struggled with one another. This was not a contention, but rather they were encouraging. The struggle was together toward holiness with mercy and conscience. A very interesting coupling of words. Mercy and conscience. Sincere and blameless you were, and forgiving in dealing with one another. All disorder and schism were abominable to you. Wow. All disorder and schism, abominable. And what are you doing now? <laughs> schism. You mourn the transgressions of your neighbors. You judge their failures to be your own. They even took upon themselves the weight of other people's holiness in life. You are unchangeable in doing good, ready for every good work, being adorned with all virtuous and venerable conduct. You accomplished everything out of reverence for him. The commands and requirements of the Lord have been written on the tablets of your heart. He's quoting from Proverbs. Proverbs 7, 1 through 3. And treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live in my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. He's saying this is what was going on there. That your conduct was good. And that the very laws of God, the very heart of God was being written inside of you. That was chapter 2. Let me, I'm going to read chapter 3 even though I did not give it to you in the handout. Um, but you can get it online. But I want you to just listen to what happened out of that. All honor and expansion were given to you, and what was written has been fulfilled. The beloved ate, drank, became fat, were fattened, and kicked back. From this comes jealousy and envy, strife and sedition, persecution and instability, war and slavery. Sounds like the works of the flesh in Galatians, doesn't it? In other words... Something happened in all of their goodness, their wealth, their prosperity in terms of spiritual goodness and all of that. Something happened. They became so confident, so prideful, so comfortable with themselves that they just basically grew fat and sloppy, spiritually speaking. Thus the dishonorable rose up against the honorable, the inglorious against the glorious, the foolish against the wise, the young against the elders. And here we go. The young against the elders. What would be wrong with that? In terms of the young versus the elders. And again, remember that's the presbyterists. Those are the elders of the church. The ordained eldership. What kind of spirit inside of the people? It violates the concept of submission. And these guys may have some right ideas. But the whole thing of submission is you submit it to the elders. Who actually may have more wisdom and experience about something. One of the things that I found between going from my brown hair to my gray hair is that the more gray hair I got, the more I found myself saying something about people as we were working together in the church and I would begin to say things like, oh, they're young. <laughs> Some of you guys are nodding your heads, yes. They're young. But that doesn't mean they don't have the wrong ideas. They may have some very good ideas. But this was an issue of contention. The young versus the elders. The young against the elders. They were pushing back in the area of submission. Now look at what happens. For this reason, justice and peace were absent. Now this we have to see. This is the goal of Clement. Clement, even though he is writing a lot about ecclesiastical order, his goal is not to show them a structure, but his goal is to bring them peace. He doesn't want to destroy the church or any member of the church in the process of what he's about to do. He wants peace to come. He wants the elders to be restored into their place, but that those who were in rebellion might come back into fullness in relationship. How good is that? That's his heart. Justice and peace are absent, and in that Each one abandons the fear of God and becomes dim-sighted in faith, 
does not walk in his lawful commands nor conducts himself in accord with the custom of Christ, but each walks according to the desires of his evil heart. Does that sound like a scripture passage you might remember from Romans, the very beginning? God gave them over to those things. This is a part of the lower nature, the concupiscence that we have to deal with. This is a part of of what we're battling in terms of continuing in unity in the church even today. I want to do it my way. I don't remember if I told you this story last week, but it, it relates to this. And that is, Father Frank Pavone one time was relating a story about one experience he had at the March for Life. And he was marching down the street, heading toward the Supreme Court building. And over on the sidewalk was a pro-abortion supporter, and she was standing there screaming at Father Pavone. And she was doing this. She was pointing to her, her womb, and she was going, This is my body! This is my body. I can do what I want. This is my body. Father Pavone all of a sudden realized she was saying the very same things he says at the words of institution in the Eucharist with a very big difference. This is my body given for you. This is what we're talking about here. Each walks according to the desires of his evil heart. It is so narcissistic, so self-arrogant. It's just, I can't think of all the words I want to think of and make up new ones even. (laughs) But that's the problem that we have, and this is one of the things why Clement is so eager to bring order back because order is what can help to placate those kinds of issues when they come up in justice and peace. The orders, the offices of the church, that's not the end. That's a means that he wants to use to get to the end, which is to bring the church to peace. Okay, we're going to stop that one, and we're going to jump to something completely different, chapter 24. I'm going to spend just a little, just a wee bit of time here, not very much, but I want to show you something fun here, because this is one of the things that a lot of people go, whoa, where did he get this? This particular area is a part of the outline where he's showing how the essentials of the Christian faith work together to provide order and unity in the church. And one of the things he's talking about here is resurrection. And he talks about a number of things, but this is a part of the order of things in the world. And he says this in chapter 24, verse 1, Let us consider carefully, beloved, how the Master constantly shows us the future resurrection. He made the Lord Jesus Christ its first fruits when he raised him from the dead. Beloved, let us examine the resurrection that happens at the right moment. And there where it says the right moment is the word katakairon, where we get kairos, which is the fullness of time. It's different from chronos, where we get chronological and the, the time on a watch or time as it goes by. But when you use kairos, it's about the fullness of times, that the resurrection of the dead will happen at just the right time in the economy of God. Day and night display resurrection for us. Night sleeps, day arises, day disappears, night comes. Let us take the fruits. How and in what way does sowing happen? The sower went out and cast each of the seeds into the ground. These seeds falling into the dry and barren ground are dissolved. Then, from this dissolution, the majesty of the master's providence makes them arise and from one seed grow more and bear fruit. Probably thinking of the parable of the sower from our Lord, he uses these as examples of resurrection. But then he uses an interesting one. Let us look more carefully at the paradoxical sign given in the eastern regions, that is in Arabia. There exists a bird called a phoenix. This is a unique bird and lives 500 years. And when its time to die arrives, It makes for itself a tomb of incense, myrrh, and other spices. And when the time is fulfilled, it enters and dies. Very interesting. When its flesh has decayed, a worm is born that nourishes itself on the secretions of the dead animal and grows wings. Then once it is old, it carries away its tomb where the bones of the old previous one are. Carrying these, it makes its way from the regions of Arabia to Egypt to the city of Heliopolis. There in the daylight, while I look on, it places them on the pedestal of the sun, and in this way it makes a start to go back. So the priests study the historical records and discover that it had come after 500 years. He was using Greek mythology. Why would he do that? 
a very interesting thing. Some people said, well, Clement must believe in the phoenix. We really don't know. He just is saying that this is something that exists in areas of Arabia, but he may be using this as kind of an allegory or a parable. But it's not necessarily true that he believes in the phoenix. But there's something else here. Turn in your Bibles. This is going to be a little bit of a search for some of you that may not be as familiar with the Old Testament. And that is just before Psalms, <laughs> there is another book called Job. <laughs> the book of Job. <laughs> I did hear a lector do that one time. A reading from the book of Job. Okay, a reading from the book of Job, and turn to Job chapter 29. We're going to see something interesting here, because just a little bit beyond this text on the phoenix, he actually quotes from the book of Job chapter 19. It seems to me that the book of Job must have been in his conscience at that time, in his consciousness, I should say. Okay, Job chapter 29, and at verse 18. Then I said... In my own nest I shall grow old. I shall multiply years like the what? Like the phoenix. My root is spread out on the waters, or out to the waters. The dew rests by night on my branches. My glory is fresh within me, and my bow is renewed in my hand. Wow. So Job uses the word phoenix. What's interesting is, and this is a transliteration into the English, but it's the Hebrew word kol, is phoenix, the word kol. What's interesting is the word kol, I love Hebrew because you can use guttural sounds, kol. It can mean three things. It can mean sand, it can mean phoenix, <laughs> I can't figure this one out, and also it can mean a palm tree. Do you have palm tree? Okay, how many have sand? Okay, how many have phoenix? How many have palm tree? Isn't that interesting? Wow. It can mean sand, it can mean phoenix, and it can mean palm tree. Well, how did we end up with phoenix? Interestingly enough, in one document called the Genesis Rabbah, or Bereshit Rabbah, it says that Eve gave the cattle, beasts, and birds to eat of the forbidden fruit. Oh, that's something we didn't know. Not only did Adam get some of the fruit, but so did the animals. All obeyed her and ate thereof and fell, except a certain bird named Coal. As it is written, Then I said, I shall die with my nest, and I shall multiply my days as the Coal. The Genesis Rabbah was composed later in about 450, but it's all about that same era where they began to translate it that way. But even in the early days of the church, there was this understanding of the phoenix as being symbolic and a type of resurrection, a type of one that has eternal life as opposed to the other animals. Even Tertullian in the 3rd century, just at the beginning, end of the 2nd, beginning of the 3rd century, says this. God, even in his own scripture, says, The righteous shall flourish like the phoenix. That is, shall flourish or revive from death from the grave to teach you to believe that a bodily substance may be recovered even from the fire. So somehow, the issue of the phoenix, even though it is a mythological creature, has become a type and a symbol in the church of the resurrection of that which was sown into death has arisen into life. I love what a, a friend of mine, Dr. Taylor Marshall, wrote about this a while ago. He said this, Job 29.18 originally had an obscure reference to Job dying in his nest and then multiplying his days like sand. Probably through Hellenic influence, the mythical idea of the phoenix was read into the passage. The idea of death and new life in the context of death and the rebirth of the nest was just too juicy to leave alone after readers knew about the mythical tradition of the phoenix bird. Thus, the Septuagint translated the passage as referring to the phoenix and not sand. Then later, the Septuagint passage was mistakenly corrected, not by returning to the sand translation, but by altering the word toward an entirely new concept, a palm tree. Interesting. 
This is a part of the editorial process that we, we encounter whenever we look at the, the scriptures, both Old and New Testament. But suffice it to say that one of the things we know about Clement is that he depended upon the Septuagint for his scripture. And so most likely when he came to Job 29, 18, what did he find there? Phoenix. So anyway, I just wanted to point out, it's a fascinating thing, but when you are reading the text, I didn't want you to go to Phoenix and go, oh man, where did that come from? Okay, now, on to chapter 40. We're going to get back to preserving the order of the church in just, what, five minutes, Deacon? Now in chapter 40, he's going to begin giving us the understanding of the essence of the church and the beginning of a solution. Chapter 40, verse 1, Since these things are clear to us and we have peered into the depths of divine knowledge, we ought to do in an orderly fashion everything that the Master commanded us to fulfill in the properly established times. So he's talking about that everything has to be done in order, and now he goes on to give us an example. He commanded that the offerings and liturgical services be fulfilled, not in empty or disorderly ways, but at predetermined seasons and hours. Remember that first diagram about the spontaneous church? In fact, a lot of Protestant New Testament scholars affirm a spontaneous worship and a, you know, no form. One of the things that Clement is underscoring here is that there was a liturgia, there was a liturgy in the early church with predetermined seasons and predetermined hours. Verse 3, but where and by whom he wants it to be fulfilled, he himself determined by his sovereign will, so that everything done in pleasing him may be acceptable to his will. Those who make their offerings in the appointed seasons are acceptable and blessed, for they do not go astray when they follow the commandments of the Master. And now he goes into an Old Testament allusion that will help to understand what's going on here in terms of the order of the church. To the high priest belong particular liturgical services. To the priests have their own place and the Levites have their own ministries. The layman is given orders appropriate for the laity. There we have for one of the few times the understanding that the laity is an order of service in the church. It's a service of evangelization and presentation of the gospel to the world and many other things involved in it. But it is not just those who don't have something else to do. Chapter 41, let each of you brothers please God in his own proper place. Now the word there for proper place is really order. In his own order with a good conscience by not transgressing the determined rule of ministry in dignity. It is not everywhere, brothers, that perpetual sacrifices are offered or prayers or those for sins and, or sin and faults. It is only in Jerusalem. He's going back to the Old Testament again, saying Jerusalem is the place of sacrifice, so don't try to invent some other place that it can be done. The same in the New Testament church. There is a predetermined rule of ministry, and if you try to reinvent it, you are moving outside of the order that God establishes. Even there is not in every place that they offered, but only before the temple at the altar. The offering is inspected for defects by the high priest and the ministers previously mentioned. Those who do anything beyond his set will have a penalty of death. See, brothers, the more worthy of knowledge we are, the more danger we come under. In other words, when, sounds like a piece of scripture, doesn't it? That you're accountable. Once you understand this, you're accountable to follow it. Now look at this, chapter 42, we have apostolic succession explained. The apostles received the gospel for us from our Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was sent from God. So Christ was from God, and the apostles from Christ. Both came by the will of God in good order. So we see the order, we have Jesus and the apostles. Verse 3. The apostles received the gospel for us from our Lord Jesus Christ and from God. So Christ was from God, the apostles from Christ, so both came by the will of God in good order. Once they received commands, and the word there for command is a military word, talking about the orders from a superior officer. Once they were made confident through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, and once they were entrusted with God's word, they went out proclaiming with confidence of the Holy Spirit that the kingdom of God would come. Okay, this was the apostolic ministry he's talking about. Listen to this. Preaching in lands 
and cities, by spiritual discernment, they began establishing their first fruits, who were bishops and deacons for future believers. There you have it. He is showing, again, how there is this ordering where the apostles found bishops and deacons. And, of course, with the bishops come the presbytery, the presbyters, the elders that work with them. And verse 5, and this was nothing new because for many ages it had been written about bishops and deacons, as Scripture says, somewhere. I love that. Somewhere. I couldn't get away with that if I was preaching a homily. <laughs> scripture says somewhere, somebody would come to me at the end, Father, where'd that come from? I want chapter and verse. I will appoint bishops for them in justice and deacons in faith. Again, it's showing the order of things. Chapter 57, this is where his entreaty comes. So you, having laid the foundation of this rebellion, submit to the presbyters and allow yourselves to be instructed for repentance as you bow down the knees of your heart, your, the very core of your being. Learn to submit by casting off arrogance and proud stubbornness of your tongue. It is better for you to be found small and accountable among the flock of Christ than to appear excellent and be cast away from his hope. How good is that? Isn't that beautiful? It is better for you to be found small and accountable among the flock of Christ. Even if you're wrong and you're accountable, it's better to be there than to be excellent and cast away. Wow. I'd love to be able to write as well as he does. And all virtuous wisdom speaks like this. Behold, I will pour forth a deliverance of my breath and I will teach you my word. Since I called and you did not obey, and since I extended my words and you did not heed, but rather rendered my counsels of no authority, you disregarded my rebukes, therefore I too will laugh at your destruction. I will rejoice whenever destruction comes to you and when confusion suddenly comes to you. This catastrophe will be like a present storm or whenever affliction and anguish come upon you. He's literally quoting from Proverbs, Proverbs 1, 23 and following. So he's not saying this about the Corinthians. He's reminding them of something that was said in the book of Proverbs, a book of practical wisdom. If you don't obey, God says, this is what's going You're just going to fall away. This catastrophe will be like a present storm. And it will happen that whenever you call on me, I will not hear you. So what does he say to, to finish this out in chapter 58? Let us obey his all-holy and glorious name by fleeing the aforementioned threats to the disobedient made through wisdom that we may dwell confidently on the most holy name of his majesty. He's calling them home. Receive our counsel and you will regret nothing. For God lives and our Lord Jesus Christ lives and the Holy Spirit lives the faith and hope of the elect because the one who has practiced the requirements and commands given by God in humility with an intense virtue will be in good order and enrolled among the number of the saved through Jesus Christ through whom is glory to him, the Father, forever and ever. Amen. And at this point he goes into a liturgy of prayer. But you see what he's doing through this entire letter. He has challenged them to look at the Old Testament teachings, challenged to look at the New Testament concepts, who Jesus Christ is, how the church is related, and all of that. And then finally comes and says, with all I'm showing you, with all of this wealth and prosperity, wouldn't it be better just to admit your fault? Come home, be forgiven, and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have a hope of eternity in Christ. This is a tremendously pastoral approach. He is not wanting anyone perish, but that all would come to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord and the Epistle of St. Clement. God bless you. Thank you very much, Father. I think we should invite him back, don't you think? Absolutely. It's a great blessing for someone who is in my job to find someone who is an authentic teacher of the faith. And so thank, thank you. you very much for teaching thank us this you. evening, Father. Father, you'll stay around for a little bit of Q&A. All right, for those that can stay around, would you take about a three or four minute break? Yeah, my only question was, uh, how come that these epistles did not make it into the canonization of the Bible? Good question. Why didn't Clement uh, make it into the Bible? 
in the early days before the canon of Scripture, it was considered Scripture in a number of places. Clement of Alexandria and others used it in the readings during the Mass. The big question that came about as a result of establishing the canon was apostles, the apostleship. Clement was not an apostle. And all of the books of the New Testament were either written by an apostle or had one that was written on behalf of an apostle, like Mark wrote it for Peter, as an example. And, of course, uh, Paul was considered an apostle, as uh, you know, born out of time. But that was the thing that restricted Clement from being included. It was considered on a par with Scripture for a number of years and is receiving, I think, a new wave of interest in modern generations, which is really great. What was the outcome of the letter as far as the church in Corinth? Is that documented? It's not documented. They don't know how the letter was actually received. They do know, again, that in Corinth it became a part of their, uh, their lectionary. It became a part of their regular readings. So obviously it made an impact. How quickly and how radically there was a turnaround, uh, we don't know. We don't know what happened to the leaders at that time. But we do know that that letter not only was considered locally binding, but it was read elsewhere as well. So it was circulated like the other epistles. Uh, Father, this is a very powerful teaching. Is there any way to adapt this to our current situation to help fix some of the problems that we have? Well, <laughs> there, there are several congressmen that need to read it. especially the part about holiness and things like that. No, seriously, we're living in a little bit of a different age, and I'm going to be looking and seeing if I can find places that might be doing some more work. I think the area of religious liberty is probably, uh, they're doing some work that's very akin to what Pope St. Clement is doing. In my mind, the one thing that we're dealing with here is more of an individualism than perhaps was back then. Back then, it was a small group taking over the church, but it was still a community event. Now it's every person for themselves. There's, there's that autonomous individualism that is rampant. What um, Francis Schaeffer used to call personal peace and affluence, where what I care about is what I want. And um, if that works for you, that's fine, but that doesn't work for me. And so there's only relative truth. One of the things that, that I think Pope St. Clement had working for him is I think there was an understanding of objective truth that perhaps may not be as relevant today in our society. We were talking uh, during the break that it used to be when I was brown-haired and, and a lot more spry, uh, when I started in ministry in the early 70s, you could actually use the Bible as a point of reference in talking with a non-Christian about the faith. Nowadays, the Bible has no reference point in culture. It is not treated with the same sense of honor that even uh, non-Christians and those of no faith were back then. So. Uh, it's a very different culture. I think, though, that there are some underlying tenets that do have a lot of, of bearing on where we are today, particularly in terms of the centrality of, for us in the church in particular, of being centered in the Holy See, of being in union, communion with the Holy Father. A very key teaching in, in, of course, our catechism is that it is about being in communion, not just being in a church, but being in communion with our bishop who is in communion with the Holy Father. Very, very critical. Father, I thought as I was reading, I was almost reading the cliff notes of the faith. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And basically, he oozed scripture out of every verse. In fact, one of the things that Fuhlenbach does is he says that there is an appeal to the kerygma. There is an appeal to the basic teachings of the church in every part of Clement. So that's exactly what you should have felt. Did St. Clement know John personally? And did he quoted him, I think. And did he quote from the book of Revelation? He did not because the book of Revelation was probably being written about the same time or a little bit after even. Whether he knows or knew John, he knows him now. Uh, <laughs> whether he knew him back then, there's no reference. He did know personally Peter and Paul. In fact, he was ordained by St. Peter and was a companion of St. Paul. In chapter 40, uh, you pointed out that St. Clement wrote, writes, the layman is given orders appropriate for the laity. 
Do you have any feel for what the orders or functions were for the laity back in those times? That would go into a whole long teaching, and I need to do some more boning up on that. But the order of the laity, one of the things about that, and, and St. Paul makes it very clear, too, about the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, that the actual work of the gospel ministry and evangelization and taking the faith literally around the world is the order of the laity's responsibility. And the equipping, which you find in St. Paul's writings, he talks about the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. The word equipping means the mending of the net. Uh, so it's basically being sure that the nets are full and ready for a great draft of fish. So um, the order of the laity is about evangelization. It's about representing the faith in the marketplace, representing the faith wherever they go, being the faith in the world. One of the things that really hit me one time years ago, I was in a church, and you didn't see it when you walked in. And as you turned around to walk out, there was a sign above the door going out, and it says you are now entering the mission field. I thought, what a cool sign. But that's, that's really, to me, that's the order of the laity. I'd have to take me a long time to go into more detail. Thank you very much, Father, for a wonderful okay. presentation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. Five, five. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.